Father, we love you and thank you for the privilege of Scripture. And Lord, this is a sheer joy to be in possession of our own copy of it. Our own pages to just field our life through and to highlight and underline and study. And as your word simply says, to cherish your word, to apply it to our hearts and to memorize it for the point of safety, protection, and defense. Allow this word to us this morning. Speak volumes to what you have done and have been doing to prepare us for what is next. Help us, Lord, to pay attention to our own individual placement in this life and as you journey with us, remind us of how much you love us. There are days, Lord, when sin gets in the way that we just forget that you love us. Help us to see you today. And of course, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the question that we want to answer is, what is heaven? We have a lot of questions in that one question. And there are at least three things that we, we're going to try to answer in our study. But um, the Bible has certain things and locations. I would tell you that if you were to ask children where heaven is, they would all go like this. It's up. Heaven is up. But we know that the heavens are around us, and that's up. But um, we want to look first and foremost at our first point is that heaven is a real place. It's a real place in the same way that Jefferson, Pennsylvania is a real place, that Pittsburgh is a real place. Um, that your house is a real location, it's a real place. And scripture gives us the most important fact that we need to keep in mind is that heaven is a real place. Our text today in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, it says, in the, be in the beginning, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. Yeah. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. For in my Father's house are many rooms or dwelling places, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. That's an amen. From the beginning of time, God has been preparing for this very moment for us to even hear or think about or dwell on or study the idea that God has been preparing us a place. Now, I, I know that's a hard concept, but I want you to understand, and I shared this not long ago, I think that if we were to really understand the character of God, we would know that Psalm 139 says that before the world was formed, that we were in his mind, that we were a part of his plan, we individually, and I, this is to separate us from the church body, that he knows you by name and that he knows where you'd be, he knew that you'd be sitting in this room this morning to that point, he knew at that moment when, before the world was created, before everything was put into place, he would have to be preparing for you to spend eternity with him. That's sort of a mind blower. And every time I begin to get in my head about that, it is sort of like one of those poof moments. And, and I, I can't handle that. The human experience cannot contain all of the spiritual experiences that exist. Which means this we may not really grasp a hold of this all at once. We may have to do this sort of in pieces and sort of grab a hold of to, or gravitate to the idea that from before the world was formed, God began working on my dwelling place, that I would spend eternity with him. And I think about my life prior to salvation. How could God have ever anticipated me, a sinner and broken and full of all kinds of issues, be subjected to the idea that I would be in a place that he had already set in motion the foundation and the idea of where I would spend eternity when I myself can't see it. And a lot of times, we as believers, even in our salvation experience, have a hard time seeing beyond what we're in front, run, right in front of. We, we struggle with seeing beyond things from the idea that God has prepared our steps way before the day we're in. Well, wait a minute, Pastor. You've said that God hasn't promised us another day. You're right, but he still sees where our steps will be. This life that we live in this world is temporary. 
we will spend eternity somewhere. We have to identify the fact that heaven is a real place. It's a real location. And so let's kind of break down the verses here. He said, don't be discouraged. Don't get troubled. Don't get worried. How many of us, by the raising of hands, can say, oh, I never worry? I don't see a hand up. Why is that? Well, because we worry. And, and we worry to the extent that even if we don't have something to worry about, we find something to worry about, or we worry that we don't have anything to worry about. We have all kinds of issues with anxiety and worrying. And if God has already answered prayer and he's directed your steps and he's already done some amazing things in your life, how can we doubt that God is real? How can we doubt that what he says in scripture is real? It is real. It's a real place. So he says, don't get worried. He said, trust in God. Trust in God. Everything that you know about him, and, and let me just be honest with you, we'll probably never in this life fully understand all of God. We will never grasp a hold of everything there is to know about him. We, but don't worry. We have an, Did you hear that? Don't worry. We have an eternity to spend with him. We have an eternity to get to know him greater than we are doing now because right now in this life we have a tendency to also be distracted. We tend to forget. We think that our heaven is here. This is not heaven, okay? As pretty as it might be some days, as awesome of, of an experience you might be having in this moment or in this time and in this life is nothing short of what, man, it's just, it falls so completely short of what heaven is. And so we have to know the heaven's a real place. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Jesus is speaking. And he says, for in my father's house are many, many dwelling places. And and, and I know the old King James says, many mansions. I love the idea. I love mansions. Okay. I, I lived in many parsonages in my life, one of which was a two-bedroom camper. Okay. They called it a trailer. It was a camper. Okay. It was 12 foot wide by 60 foot long. And we had five kids at the time. And I thought, dad, what were you thinking? They added on two rooms and eventually we, we just didn't fit. We didn't fit. And uh, so I always thought in that time, when I read that verse, I can't wait to live in a mansion that I don't share a room with my sister. You know how twisted that is? That's awful. There was hair everywhere. Okay? You know, so the idea, let's just be real academic about it. Heaven and a dwelling place or a mansion, man, I can't wait. My own dwelling place. God saw, and, and again, you have to pull away from this in the idea that this is sort of this corporate thing. We didn't corporately come to Christ. We individually surrendered to Christ. He individually called us out of our sin and into the light. And it is a personal experience. So when he says here that in my father's house are many dwelling places, and that he's gone to prepare it for you, he's not corporately speaking, he's individually speaking. He says, listen, now that, does that mean I get my own space and I don't have to share a closet with my wife or my husband, and I don't have all these kids running around driving me crazy and messing the house up. I, I, I sometimes like to watch game shows that have trivia questions about home life. Because I often wonder, you know, I'm the middle of seven. We had um, what it was called organized chaos. It was noisy. It was always chaotic. There were always more children in the house than our own. And there were, you know, you figure there's seven, okay, and then there would be all of their friends, or, you know, not just mine, and then we had the occasional foster kids that were placed with us, and then their friends. There could have been 30 kids on the grounds at any time. Good thing we lived next to the church. We always had the parking lot and the cemetery to, you know, harass people, but um, we, we always had so much chaos. I also go back to that moment and think, finally, a room to myself and peace and quiet and solitude. That's not far from the truth. Heaven, of, heaven is a place of solitude. So let's look at this again. He says, I, there's a place. He says, I go, I'm going there. Jesus is preparing the disciples. I'm headed there to prepare a place for you. I'm going to get it ready. Don't be worried, but I'm going there to prepare it. And I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And then I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back. It's, it's really an awesome sense of peace to know 
that Jesus was telling those that he traveled with, those that he ministered with, but even to the extent that he's sharing it with us, that there is a place, a real place, that he's going to go and get ready. I'm sure we've all had somebody come to our house and, and stay over and visit. And we've gone and prepared the guest room and gotten fresh sheets on it. I don't know if you went to the sense of, you know, maybe putting a couple mints on the pillow like they do at a nice hotel. That's always nice to do, by the way. And, 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 and getting the food prepped and, and, and you're just going to, you're trying to entertain and, and make everyone be, you know, feel comfortable. That preparation is the same idea here. That God has gone and prepared us a place. Jesus said, listen, we're, we're setting aside things to get it ready for you. Every one of us are going to enter that place at a different time. and Some are all going to go in the clouds, and that's okay too. I'm up for the cloud way. Amen? Anybody else with me? I'm good, I'm good to go in the cloud. But, you know, God always has a great plan, and I'm not going to worry about it. So right here in these verses, Jesus calls heaven a place. He's gone to prepare us a place. It's a legitimate place. He means that my father's house, his dwelling place, is an actual real place, as real as we are sitting in Jefferson today. Is that a hard concept to get a hold of? We visualize heaven as these, I don't know, maybe weird structures floating on a cloud. I, I don't know that it's a cloud. I don't know that it's a planet. I don't know that it's a star. I don't know if, that if it's just suspended. I, I have these idea of pictures, these ideals of what it might be. But if the God who created the universe we live in and exist in created all that we have around us, if he created this big ball of rock and dirt and gas that we, we're sort of floating in space on and we're sort of amazed at when we discover a new part of the galaxy and, and we move on beyond our galaxy into someplace else and, and, and we're sort of amazed at how big it is, I'm sure you've all sat on a back porch one time and looked up into the sky and just been dumbfounded as to how small and insignificant we could be on this tiny planet. If the God that created all of this, and we look at our earth as being pretty big, I mean, who's to say? He can't create whatever he wants. That he hasn't created some amazing can I just be crass a little bit? Spiritual theme park? I, I just see heaven as a place of celebration. You know, we, we often thought, and I've, I've talked with kids as a youth pastor for many times, I, I, I love surveying them to get their ideas. What are you thinking about? What do you think heaven's like? These guys were no help this morning, by the way. They, they are as cute as a button, but they were no help. They just weren't connecting. But I got thinking about this. I've asked teenagers what they thought heaven was like. And you got the suspended city in the clouds and and it's up somewhere way up in there in the heavens, and, 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 and that's great. My next question was, what do you think we're going to do there? <sighs> Go to church. Just like that. The attitude just rolled off of their face and their, their voice. We're just going to go to church. And I thought, maybe we don't have to go to church because we will be with. Why do we go to church? We come to church to worship God. We worship him because we're separated from him right now in that sense, a physical way. I just view heaven, and this is, of course, in the whole idea of my study. I just, I view heaven as a great place to just celebrate. I mean, have you ever got up in the morning? It's the perfect temperature. The sun's not bright, blinding you to the point that it's just this gorgeous morning. The neighbor's flowers aren't too fragrant, but they're fragrant enough that you can enjoy them without sneezing. And, and you're just sitting there maybe enjoying the best absolute cup of coffee you've ever made in your life. I mean, everything is in line. And you're just, you're breathing this in and you just think, man, if, if this is anything like heaven, it's going to be great. I, I just think of the, the celebration the celebration of life, the idea that God is going to be with us. It's a real place. The second thing here, though, is that heaven is a dwelling place of God. It's not just a real, a, a real place. 
but it's the dwelling place of God. In, in Philippians uh, chapter 3, verse 20, our citizenship is there in heaven. So we recognize that we're only here for a, just a spat of time. I just made that up. You like that spat of time? That means you could spit and hit it and it's over with. That's how quick it is. King James is a lot more colorful when it says it's a vapor. The existence of a vapor. This life, 70, 80, 90, 100 years old, God bless us if we get beyond 100. That's wonderful. That's awesome. But we think of that as a long time. It's a vapor. It's a vapor. And it's the dwelling place of God. Our citizenship is there. That's where when we surrender to Jesus, we are now given a guarantee that our place will be with him in glory. In a place of perfect temperature. No worries about weather. If you like snow, I'm sure there might be a little place so you can go see some snow. I don't know. My dad's convinced, I've shared this before, that there's a golf course there. There's 19 holes because 18 was never enough. And uh, there's, there's some amazing banquet being prepared, food beyond our wildest imagination. And the great thing is, is nobody has to clean up and nobody has to set up. Can you say amen? I mean, think about that. No chairs and tables to set up. It's all done. We just show up. We're the children of the king. And we are given this hope that this is not only a real place, but it's the dwelling place of God. His throne is there. His place of authority. His, his rule is there. This is an awesome place. I, you know, I got thinking too, why would anybody want to talk about heaven? Why wouldn't anybody want to talk about heaven? When we turn on the news and we read the newspaper, we listen to something on the internet, we, we can become worried and discouraged and scared about what's happening in our world. I just shared this on Wednesday night. I don't believe that it's really, and you can disagree with me, and that's okay, I'll love you anyway. But I don't believe the world is actually all that much worse than it was in the day that Paul wrote the book of Romans. Because I can read in the book of Romans all kinds of stuff that was going on and all kinds of just disgusting things. And yet, some would say, well, you know, the world's made full circle and here we are again. I just think we hear about it a whole lot more. I think we hear about it a whole lot faster. And I think we're, we're caught up in hearing about it. I think if, if Christians spent a little bit more time thinking about where we're headed, we'd be more concerned about the people that aren't going to make it. It might connect us a little bit greater to the Great Commission to say we need to get busy about sharing our faith with others. See, I have the hope. I, there's no doubt in my mind. I, I can honestly stand before you today and that if my life were required of me today, I would not be in your presence. I would be in the presence of God in the amazing place we call heaven. I truly believe that. There's not a doubt in my mind. Do you have that assurance? Do you have that promise? Do you have that hope? Because without that hope and without that assurance and without that detail, let me just tell you, you have a lot to be worried about. You have a lot to be concerned about. I don't worry about that. That's the least of my worries. Sometimes I worry more about what we're going to make for dinner. That's, that's something that's right now. God's got my future taken care of. But to know that God exists there, this is his dwelling place, which means what? That means when I arrive there, I know who's in control. We can get worried about politicians. We can get worried about all kinds of things happening in our world with other rulers and how they run their country and what effect it might have on our nation. We can get worried about who's going to declare war on us or who we're going to declare war on. I mean, let's just be honest. That's not political. That's just the fact of the matter. Human nature from the beginning of time has been at war with one another. You don't believe me? Go look it up. We have a lot to be worried about in this life, but yet we don't. As a believer in Christ, we know that this is temporary. This is temporary. I have to know that all authority falls to God, and I will be in his presence, and I won't have one thing to worry about. I won't have one thing to be concerned about. Third thing in this point is this. Heaven is not that far away. And that's on two levels. We're going to look at them both. He says, or, uh, in, here in John, he says that um, 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back to you and I will bring you to where I am so that we'll be together. The Bible hints here that heaven is not far away because heaven is not only a real place, but it's a place where God resides. But beyond that, if I could turn my page, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 to 24, it says this, But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names... uh, whose names are written in heaven, you have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better uh, better word than the blood of Abel. The writer here of Hebrews uh, is compelling Mount si- or comparing Mount Sinai to Mount Zion. And under this oldest covenant, he... Um, he illustrates this conversation, this this um, interaction with God. God accepts under every strict condition. We are not that far from heaven, are we? As we grow older, we realize that, and I know this is sometimes a depressing moment, but I have to look at it as an exciting time. The older we get, the closer we get to heaven. We know that this life is is a vapor. And death is a reality of life. We can't remove one from the other. So the older we get, we understand that that's a normal process. And so as we grow in age, that we are growing closer to the coming of our entrance into a place that we've only read about and that we can never say, I have experienced. We had friends um, years ago take a trip to Ireland. And they were so excited and they booked their trip and they got all the details and sent us pictures on the internet and just what a wonderful time and the green I mean just the just the colors of Ireland is just beautiful I enjoy um, traveling to lots of places um, I do it through Google Earth um, it's cheaper uh, I don't worry about you know infections or COVID or anything like that um, about being on a plane that might crash into the ocean um, I don't worry about booking hotels or finding one that's not as nice as the other Google Earth allows me to sit in my recliner and I can pan through and experience those areas and I can look at them and you're laughing at me, but I do this from time to time when I'm bored, you know, just sort of get on my phone and travel. Uh, Sometimes I visit old places I've lived. The trailer we lived in is no longer and uh, I've checked on that. I just wanted to see what pastor they subjected to that mess. Um, But, uh, you know, I've traveled different places, not... Like that, I have imagined what it might be like to be in a place that would be so supernaturally amazing. And heaven is the one place that I can't even imagine. I, I don't really have a picture other than these little details. But what's exciting is to know that we're not that far away. The travel, we flew to Georgia one time and, and you know, it's only like maybe a 45 minute flight. You're up and you're down and you barely get your peanut swallowed and you're landing. And it's a great quick flight, and that's awesome, except if you don't like to fly, um, I'm very claustrophobic, so the idea of sitting in the last seat in the plane, because that's the cheapest one, um, and looking all the way down that long tube of people, thinking if I had to get off this quick, I will be the last one off the plane, and the panic, the sheer panic begins to ensue. So then, of course, I'm looking down, finding something to read, and, you know, it's what to do in the event of an accident or a crash. That's not the reading material you really want to have on a plane. I kept thinking of traveling. So then the next time we went to Georgia, I said, we're driving. We're going to drive. We're going to drive 12 hours in the car with two kids. I don't know which was worse. You know, the smell emanating from the back, you know, of food and feet and all of that. And then the 12 hours of, I need to go to the bathroom. I'm hungry. Are we there yet? You know, and it's just... It's a long process. So getting there, to know that heaven's not that far away, that's awesome. That's awesome. It's a beautiful thing. We know that um, we're not far from the angels either, that, that heaven is littered with them. This, these are the, the handmaids. These are those that God has created to be his assistants in doing whatever he needs done. 
Uh, those, by the way, are those that are setting up the table, serving the food, cleaning the dishes, and all of that at the banquet. Those are the angels. Can you say amen? It won't be us. Baptist folks, listen, we're going to enjoy that meal. We're going to just sit down and not have to worry about it. I don't know that there'll be fried chicken, but there better be something fried, right? Because we don't have to worry about cholesterol or salt intake or any of that. You know, I don't know what all is going to be served there. I know that we're not far away from our loved ones, those that have already gone ahead and uh, already enjoying the privileges and the benefits of heaven. It's a great thought to think about, isn't it? That we know that someone that we love so much that we're missing in this life is there and a part of the whole process. That they're already there. They're enjoying all of that. We know that we are not far from God. And Friend, listen, I know that there are times in our journey in this life we sometimes feel far from God, don't we? There are times where we just aren't connected. We've gotten distracted. We've gotten off track. We've kind of got our focus off. It's good to know that we're really not that far from God. That if heaven's not that far away, and we know that's where the throne of God is, then we have to realize that we're not that far from God. A spiritual note, we know that we're never that far from God. It's simply calling on the name of Jesus to interact with him. That at any given time, we as a believer have the privilege of calling on the name of Jesus. And we immediately, without, wait a minute, hold on, I'm busy, I'm dealing with this person. We have no interruption. We have an immediate connection to the creator. We don't even do that for folks. We don't even do that. We, we put people off and we keep people at distance and we have things that are more important or more prioritized in a way that we'll hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. God's not this far away. We are actually nearer to him than you think. The Bible says that when we enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, he is our indwelling power. He is our indwelling presence. He is there with us. So we're really not that far from God, are we? Because he is in us. What a great experience to know that in any moment where I'm doubting or I'm fearful or I'm angry or I've messed up, my God is still near to me. I may have stepped away, but he's still where he belongs. And he is there to aid us and help us in any way that he possibly can. God has created heaven as a place to be, a place to exist, and a place to dwell beyond this life. But right now, we have to know that God has given us this time to think about it, to dwell about it, to imagine what it might be like, to imagine That God loves us not enough just to give us salvation, but to prepare for us a place beyond what we see here. What we know to be. It's way more than our words or our understanding can ever handle. Heaven is a real place. It's a real place. Can you say amen? Amen. Let's stand as we close. God, thank you so much for what you have done, how you have prepared us, God, how you have loved us, and even in this very moment, how you've reminded us that you have put things in order. You have constructed a place for us to dwell, to be with you forever. Forever is a concept we might not really get, but God, you have done it. Thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for heaven. Thank you for the peace that passes all understanding. In our moments of doubt, in our moments of struggle, and in our moments of sin, thank you for being close so that when we reach out, we find you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.